faculty member of Princeton Neuroscience Institute and program on quantitative and computational biology. Naomi Leonard is MacArthur Fellow and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a fellow of IEEE, ASME, SIAM, and IPAC. Naomi Leonard received her Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Princeton University in 1985 and the Master's and PhD degrees in Electrical Engineering from the University of Maryland in 1991 and 1994. From 1985 to 1989, she worked as an engineer in the electric power industry. <laughs> So we're, it seems we are ready, so <laughs> one more time apologies and I'll keep it short. So yeah, let's welcome Naomi for the plenary. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your patience. Um, so today I, I am going to talk about recent work on human decision making uh, in um, a range of tasks um, from things like resource allocation to search in uncertain environments where there's the fundamental trade-off between uh, making choices to exploit uh, what's been understood, what's known, uh, making good options, um, versus uh, making choices to explore perhaps poorly known options, uh, but that might yield uh, uh, something good. Um, because humans are actually pretty good at this explore-exploit trade-off, um, the idea of taking a rigorous look at um, the heuristics that humans use um, can be quite useful for um, thinking about how we might design and evaluate strategies in a whole, um, whole range of, of decision-making scenarios that involve humans or involve robots that involve humans and robots together. So what I want to do today is uh, sort of first show you how the multi-arm bandit framework provides an excellent framework for studying uh, human behavior and explore exploit tasks and how we can learn and leverage um, by integrating um, biologically plausible heuristics with rigorous uh, mathematical algorithms and theory. So the general problem here um, is one in which a decision-making agent is uh, asked to make a sequence of choices among options which return um, uncertain rewards where their goal is to maximize accumulated reward. Uh, so this could be, for example, a search problem. So searching over um, uh, an uncertain or unknown uh, resource field, like in this picture I show here, which is um, a discretization of a circular region where um, there is a, a resource field um, uh, over which one would like to find uh, optimal location. So here, if red is, is high reward and blue is low reward, you know, the, the, the decision maker doesn't know um, uh, where to go, but by making choices among these cells, they'd like to pick the cells that, that yield the highest reward. Um, when, they, when they get to a cell, they get a measurement that's noisy or has lots of uncertainty, and so each time they make a choice, they're faced with this dilemma, should should you know? Should you exploit what you know and pick among those those options that that are, are giving you high reward, or should you go and explore where where little is known? Uh, you can kind of see in this problem where all the options are sort of spatially distributed that there might be some advantage uh, in the case where there's correlation among um, uh, among the cells. So you can see that there are these patches of of you know high reward where you know we see this big patch of, of red and you can so you can imagine that this that that knowing something about a spatial correlation scale can help in this process I don't need to explore every cell that that's close by um, and you know in the case where the the length scale is even bigger for example in the picture on the right I might even be able to get away with a lot less exploration so this is something that's that's um, uh, an interesting feature, something that, that uh, humans are actually good at appreciating and taking advantage of. So in these problems, there's a whole bunch of challenges. I mean, the first problem is that there's lots of uncertainty. You go, you make a choice, um, you get a, a noisy measurement of reward. You might have limited time, so in a lot of the problems we look at, um, like a search problem, you don't have forever. So looking at asthmatotic uh, performance isn't necessarily uh, going to cut it, so one needs to understand what happens in, um, in 
short time horizons. You might also have challenges associated with costs, so you might need to make choices, but making switches rather than staying where you are might be costly, so you have to be wise and efficient about that. Or there might be constraints. You might not be able to take every path. You might not be able to choose every option given where you are. Um, and then it may be the case that you have multiple decision makers. So um, what happens when there are a lot of people making decisions and, and maybe through a communication network we can share information? How do we coordinate um, to make good decisions uh, uh, together? So there's, there's lots of different places where decision making and under uncertainty shows up. The, the sort of pedestrian example is, is you know, choosing what restaurant you're going to go to. Um, you know, should you, should you go to the one that's tried and true or maybe try something new and different? It might depend upon your, your horizon. If I'm here in um, Urbana-Champagne, I have a very short time horizon. I might pick something that someone's told me is good rather than trying something new. Maybe if you live here, you try something brand new because you have lots of time to explore and, and take advantage of it later. Other settings might be um, making choices in some kind of... Um, parameter space, so for design. So this is something that an aerospace company talked to us about. You know, how do we make choices um, to explore different options, say, for designing a wing, when it might be expensive, actually, to, 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 um, to check out an option. So if you, even to run a big simulation code to see if this wing design works could be very expensive. So how do I make smart choices not knowing what reward, what kind of performance I'll get for my choices? Um, then there's all kinds of search tasks, like going into the Gulf of Mexico after the spill. How do I think about directing a, 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 you know, a, a robotic vehicle to, to move around um, the Gulf and take samples in places where I'm hoping to find um, high concentration of oil because I need to go and bring resources to clean it up? I've actually motivated um, by something along those lines from work that I did, I guess now over a decade ago, um, where we, this was with uh, former students and collaborators, uh, where we had developed a, a lot of theory and algorithms for what we called an adaptive ocean sampling network. So this was a, a, a team of, of autonomous robots that um, we put into the ocean. This was in Monterey Bay, California. Uh, these were actually, they're called underwater gliders, the vehicles that we use, they look like this. Um, and the, the idea was that they were just covered with sensors and we could use them as sensor arrays or in these moving patterns to, co to collect data in ways that the oceanographers had not um, used them before. We were trying to collect data so that in real time uh, people who were running ocean forecasting models could assimilate the data. And so for instance we did things um, like demonstrate our algorithms for formations. This is a formation of three uh, vehicles. So sort of this was in uh, 2003. This is something like 10 or 12 hours. The, 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 the yellow, tiny yellow dots are the vehicles moving underwater, collecting uh, temperature and, and concentration of plankton and salinity and current measurements. And the idea was that they could compute gradients, follow the gradients. In fact, we were chasing cold water. It's kind of like an exploit problem. We're taking measurements and trying to, to find something interesting in the ocean. In 2006, we moved vehicles around. Uh, so again, we had developed uh, some theory and these motion patterns to coordinate networks of vehicles. So again, you're looking overhead um, in Monterey Bay. This is a 20 by 40 kilometer region where we were coordinating vehicles. The gray lines show who's sort of communicating with whom. And uh, this was an ex exploration problem. So we were trying to minimize uncertainty. So how do you take advantage of, in this case, spatial length scales and temporal length scales in the fields that we were measuring here, temperature, um, so that you coordinate these guys to um, maximize the entropic information and the data they were collecting. What was interesting about this is we had all this theory um, to automate the vehicles, but there were about, I had about 10 co-PIs, and we played a pretty big supervisory role in this whole thing, making sort of high-level decisions at a sort of um, a slower time scale about what we would do, and we had no theory. It was very ad hoc. But it was very interesting for me to understand the kind of expertise that I would get from the oceanographers, for instance. And they were things like telling me exactly what they expected in terms of spatial um, correlation scales. So they didn't know anything about what the actual temperature measurements were, but they knew how they were spatially correlated. So, um, and that helped a lot. That helped me understand how to organize an, uh, my motion patterns. It also helped me figure out what size triangle that, those were three kilometers apart, the vehicles as they moved around. Um, 
So the, uh, the literature is vast. I mean, this is, you know, thinking about how humans make decisions, even thinking about how animals make decisions. People have been thinking about this for a long time. I'm just noting, you know, just a few of the many, you know, many even seminal papers in the field just for your um, information. So the, so the big field of neuroeconomics is a really important one that brings together neuroscience, economics, psychology, um, to think about the role of uncertainty and uh, risk um, in decision making. Um, and uh, people in cognitive psychology have actually used multi-armed bandits, have thought very hard about this explore-exploit trade-off um, going uh, way back. I've just uh, listed a couple, uh, three papers um, that have been particularly inspirational. Um, and likewise, interestingly enough, people have looked at how animals make decisions, so in particular foraging, uh, so choosing among patches, using a multi-armed bandit framework. So even back in, in the 70s, they were testing, you know, with a two-armed bandit whether these birds were, were um, performing like a, the optimal solution to the two-armed um, bandit problem. So, so what I'm going to do today then is, you know, try to sort of take you through some of some of our ideas on how, how you know, we can um, start to address some of the questions I raised. You know, how is how is this framework useful for studying humans? How can we then l learn and leverage uh, from them uh, for for human decision making, but also for robotics or for human robot teams? And I'm going to begin by um, just reviewing for those of you who aren't so familiar with the multi arm band framework very quickly and tell you a little bit about sort of the state of the art, um, the, the UCB algorithm, uh, which treats um, uh, uniform in time kinds of performance. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about humans and how we can adapt algorithms um, to human behavior. So in particular, I'm going to look at a Bayesian framework and think about introducing priors, also introduce randomness, so thinking about decision making that has some stochasticity in it. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we sort of add robots, how we think about estimating human priors f f using machines. Um, or how we use algorithms that have been uh, d derived to model humans to um, inspire algorithms for robots. And then I want to tell you about some pretty exciting new results on the sort of the multi, multi agent, the multiplayer uh, problem, and how we can take advantage of the communication network and thinking about explore exploit um, performance. So I'm even going to propose what we call an explore exploit centrality index, so trying to understand who in a network might be doing the best job in terms of explore versus exploit uh, performance. So the multi-arm bandit problem, um, as many of you know, is a problem in which um, one is given n options. And the standard problem, um, we're going to look at a stationary um, bandit problem. The reward for each option is a random variable with some unknown mean. Let's call it mi for the ith option. And the objective is to make a sequence of choices among these options and maximize accumulated reward until some time capital T. So capital T is your time horizon. So it's can be shown that it's equivalent to, uh, so maximizing accumulated reward can be shown to be equivalent to minimizing what's known as expected uh, cumulative regret. So here regret, R of T at time uh, T, is the difference between the expected reward where you to choose the, the, the best arm, I star, um, and uh, the reward, the, the expected reward of the arm that you chose, m i of t. And so expected cumulative regret is just summing up till time t. This regret, it's, it's equal to um, uh, summing over the arms, the difference between the, the, the rewards at the arm and the optimal reward, and the expected number of times, n i of t, that you've chosen this suboptimal arm up till time t. That should be... Capital T, sorry. <clears throat> so in the seminal paper by Lyon Robbins in 1985, uh, they, were sh they showed um, a lower bound on expected cumulative re regret, which is logarithmic in uh, time horizon in T, in capital T. Um, and so that was uh, a step in doing that was to show that the expected number of times that you pick a suboptimal arm until time T is logarithmic in T. Um, and the, the factor in front is inversely proportional to the Kolbeck-Liebler divergence between the reward density for 
the arm that you chose and uh, for the eighth arm and the optimal arm. So for example, I'm going to look a lot today at um, rewards that come from Gaussian distribution. So um, suppose our rewarded arm I is from a Gaussian distribution with mean mi and variance sigma squared. Then plugging into the expression for the kovac liebler divergence, I can see that the expected number of times um, a suboptimal arm will be chosen is lower bounded by something that is, uh, is logarithmic in T, where the, the factor in front um, is proportional to, to the variance. So if it's a noisier set of arms, it's going to be harder to, uh, um, my lower bound will be higher. It's going to be harder to uh, distinguish the optimal arm. Likewise, if, if uh, delta I is small, meaning that there's very little difference between arm, you know, a suboptimal arm and the optimal arm, that's also going to push up the bond. It's going to be harder to distinguish a closer um, uh, in reward bound uh, reward, uh, arm. So in um, 2000, our et al. Uh, published a, a very important paper, um, uh, an algorithm called the upper confidence bound. Uh, so this achieves uh, logarithmic regret um, uh, uniformly in time. So this means that they were able to find an upper bound that was logarithmic in time, and the, the constant is not quite the the Lie Robbins bound, but it's it's getting there. And so the idea here is that uh, the algorithm goes as follows. First you go ahead and you you play every arm once. And then at each time afterwards you pick the option that maximizes this value function Q sub I. Um, and that's that value function Q sub I looks like the sum of two terms. The first is your frequentist estimate of the mean of arm I. And then you add to it an uncertainty measure C sub I. Okay? So they call this um, um, optimism in the face of uncertainty because what you're doing is you're, is you're estimating your best guess at every option and then you're picking among the options that has the highest best, like sort of the best possible reward that you might receive. So for example, if you have three options where your, your uh, mu i's plus your ci's i's look like this, here you would choose option three, even though option two and option three have the same estimate of the, the mean, there's more uncertainty in option three. So the ci is like pushing for explore, and uh, you know, pushing for options that have lots of uncertainty, and mu i's pushing for options that have a, have a high um, expected um, rate of, of return. And so here's the, 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 that bound, that uncertainty, um, c sub i, it's the square root of two times the logarithmic of, of t, divided by the number of times um, uh, i has been selected. And, it, and you can kind of see why this works by um, applying this uh, turnoff inequality. So if you look at the probability that the actual um, expected uh, uh, reward is greater than this, this upper bound that you've uh, given, that's lower bounded by this exponential. And if you plug in this, um, this choice of C, you can see that it's one over T to the fourth. So, so independent of how many times you choose it, your confidence in this upper bound is, is growing with time. Right, and um, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's kind of important. So you can see, even if you don't choose it, it's it, you know, C of I grows logarithmically with T, right? So that's kind of nice. So for some reason, you pick the optimal arm, and you just get a bad, you you get a low uh, return. You know, the uncertainty will grow, so you'll eventually go back there and sample it again. Um, but also, if you pick it a lot of times, if you pick something a lot of times, you know, your uncertainty goes down, and if the estimate is bad, you know, you won't go back there again. Uh, so it was, it was through this choice of CI they were able to prove this sort of upper bound, this logarithmic upper bound, so this logarithmic performance. Um, uh, so this is an example of a, of a piece of uh, work in uh, the sort of psychology world that has in influenced us a lot. Actually, Jonathan Cohen um, is a colleague at Princeton in the Neuroscience Institute. And um, so they did this experiment to try to understand actually two things. One was the role of time horizon in making these explore exploit choices, but also the role of uh, randomness. Um, so they were very interested in the fact that, you know, if you think about it, to do it to make an exploration choice, to choose an option that's going to give you, you know, lots of um, uh, 
information, uh, it actually takes a little bit of work, and they didn't, it's sort of in the literature that it's sort of clear that we don't necessarily have all that structure in the brain to make those kinds of sort of, they call directed exploration. So instead, you know, you can kind of do this, you know, you close your eyes and pick, uh, pick an option, and that would be making sort of a random choice. So they, they looked at this two-arm bandit, so on the right is the blue um, choice, on the left is the red choice, and in fact, they did a very careful job. They, they had you come in and make decisions after having been told what your first four choices were and what the reward was, so they could manipulate uh, which options um, would be the explore and which one would be the exploit options by telling you essentially which ones you'd chosen. So which ones you knew about, which, and they could plant what, with what the, the means were. So for example, in the case of the red, you know, the average of the three, your frequentist estimate would be 64. On the right, all you would know would be, is, is, your, is a, a, sort of a very uncertain estimate of 60, right? So if you were to exploit you would pick the one on the left, the red one. If you were to explore, you'd pick the one, the blue one. And so they looked at the case in which you only had one choice. Your time horizon was one. And then they looked at the case where you had the uh, time horizon of six. And they're showing you here uh, in the plot on the left that, as you might expect, um, when they fit it to a model where they have a QI that looks very similar to the one we had before, the first term is kind of like an exploit term, and the second term is like an explore term, and they were trying to fit that gain, that what they call the information or the ambiguity bonus. Um, when you have a very short time horizon, you don't explore, right? When you have a longer one, you do a lot more exploring. Um, but likewise, in terms of this sort of random exploration, they saw that because they added a sort of a stochastic decision-making among those QI, and they saw that a lot more randomness and decision-making happened when you had more, more of a time horizon. So, so here's just a kind of a, a list of, of that and other um, what we've what we've learned uh, from our colleagues and from the literature about the way humans make decisions. And one is, of course, this idea that humans do make use of of uh, what they call an ambiguity bonus, which is sort of opting for an explore uh, choice, and that shows up in, in in these algorithms with this choice of the of this certain uh, this um, uncertainty CI. Um, there's also this notion of familiarity with the environment, so humans um, uh, very quickly become familiar with the environment. So this idea of trying to, to introduce uh, decision makers that have some priors in their inference step is, is the way we're handling that. And, and then this idea of randomness in decision making, so um, uh, sort of the inherent noisiness. So we, we add here a stochastic arm selection, um, which I'll tell you about. Um, this idea of dependence on the time horizon is something that we, in, we can include in our algorithms. And then this idea of um, exploiting uh, environmental structure. So I kind of motivated that with this idea of taking advantage of, of uh, priors uh, on correlation among options. And, and this we can do um, in the Bayesian setting uh, with uh, correlation priors. Okay, so let me just sort of step you through these algorithms that we've developed. Um, and this is um, all uh, reported in a paper from 2014 in the Proceedings of the IEEE. This is joint work with former student Paul Reverdy, um, who's now postdoc at Penn, and uh, former postdoc Vaibhav Srivastava, who's now an assistant professor at Michigan State um, in electrical engineering. So um, the first step of this you know, addressing a, a decision making under uncertainty is the inference step. And so, as I suggested, we look at a Bayesian inference. I'm going to tell you the story for Gaussian uh, distributions on our rewards. Um, and let's just assume um, that our um, decision maker has some prior, which, which we can say the mean is uh, denoted with a vector mu naught. So, those are the vectors of the priors on the, the n means of the n rewards of the n options, and a covariance matrix, so an n by n uh, covariance matrix, a uh, sigma naught, which we can, in the case of spatially embedded um, options, like some kind of reward surface, we could, for instance, pick these off-diagonal terms, um, like you know we've done exponential in the distance between them uh, with a correlation scale, something like lambda. Okay, so this is a very standard um, uh, step here. Once we, um, uh, you know, define RT here as the reward, um, 
the we can update uh, the belief state uh, mu sub t and sigma sub t here uh, lambda t is the precision matrix the inverse of the covariance um, by just computing our posterior uh, precision and our posterior mean. This we can then use in the next step, which is to write down um, the, our value functions so that we can then make a decision among these options. Okay, and so what we do here is leverage this beautiful paper by Kaufman et al., um, who developed what they call the Bayes uh, UCB algorithm. So this was um, uh, making the step from a frequentist estimate to a Bayesian estimate. Um, they did this in the case of a uh, Bernoulli award, so we, we had to extend, but um, in a very, very nice, uh, straightforward way to the Gaussian setting. Um, and here again, the idea, just like in the regular UCB algorithm, is that we want to come up with this sort of best possible guess, such that the probability that the actual reward, the actual expected reward, will be greater than this, this upper bound. Um, and we want to be able to control that, I'm going to call it alpha t, so that that decreases over time, independent of the number of times you choose um, that suboptimal arm. Okay, and so the way they do that is to use the quantile function, so the inverse of the CDF, the cumulative distribution function for, um, uh, in this case, for the Gaussian. So here's the idea, if I let uh, p be one minus alpha t, then I can just uh, compute um, uh, my, this, this um, mu i plus c i t, this upper, um, uh, the sort of best possible guess, so that the probability that the mean is less than or equal to that is it's just the inverse of the CDF of mu i plus c i t, of, of p, whatever I want p to be. And then the probability that mi is greater than that is 1 minus p, which is just my alpha t, and I can design alpha t so that my confidence is growing with time. All right, so that's the idea. We actually call this the upper credible limit algorithm. So if you pick at each uh, time t um, the option i that maximizes this best possible guess, and you design the best possible guess so that you're using now the Bayesian, um, this posterior mean mu, mu i at time t, um, then add to it the posterior variance times, this is just the standard uh, CDF, um, capital Phi, the inverse of that. One, so one minus, and so here alpha T is one over some gain, capital T, times time. So this is going to decrease with time. I can choose capital T to be a function of the time horizon, the number of choices that I have. Um, and um, one can show uh, this that we get this uniform in time um, uh, logarithmic cumulative regret by showing that the expected number of times that we pick suboptimal arms is bounded above by this logarithmic in time. So it's, you know, there's sort of an interesting story that if you pick, I mean, we have a formal way to talk about what we mean by good priors, you can do better in performance. In fact, there's a slight uh, if you have really good priors, if you make the t, t squared, you actually can do sublogarithmic, as you might expect in, um, in the cumulative regret. So what I'm showing you here is performance. So this is this performance measure, which is that you know, sum of the regret over time as a function of time. And so you know, the higher up the curve goes, the worse is the performance. So here red is the, is the case of, you know, I still get logarithmic regret, um, um, and, but it's higher than were I to have good priors. So then the next step we do is add in the stochasticity. So instead of just proving, uh, instead of just choosing the best among those QIs, we make that stochastic. So this is like a, um, like a Boltzmann selection action. I mean, if you think about having two options and you want to you pick one, it would look like this kind of standard softmax. Right, so, Q, so here's the probability of choosing option one at time t as a function of the difference between QI minus Q, uh, Q1 minus Q2. So of course, when Q1 is really high, I, I pick it with probability one. When it's really low, I pick the other with probability one. Uh, but in between, depending upon this um, temperature V sub T, um, I have some uh, uncertainty, right? If, if it was flat, right, I would just flip a coin. Um, 
So, I mean, this is kind of like simulated annealing. If I pick a schedule, a cooling schedule like 1 over log t, you know, eventually it's going to be deterministic, right? Um, and that's, that's a good idea. We show that if you use kind of a feedback um, cooling schedule where you look at kind of the, the minimum among the differences of the, of the QIs um, over uh, logarithmic in T, you can get, again, even with a stochastic choice, a logarithmic in T um, cumulative regret kind of performance. Okay, so that's accumulating a lot of the features that I told you, right? We have stochasticity, we have um, the ambiguity bonus, we have the opportunity to uh, be familiar with the environment and to even um, have priors associated with uh, sort of structure, like this, this spatial correlation um, length scale. Um, so my student Paul went ahead then and ran um, a series of experiments with uh, human subjects. Um, this he did using Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is quite useful. He actually got he got hundreds of participants. In this case, we have 326 participants who played this basically grid world search game. Um, so we, we gave them this, I don't know if you can tell, this is a 10 by 10 grid. Um, so you're just looking at you know these blank squares and you're told to, to make choices. And in fact, you're told you only have 90 choices, so we're really interested in seeing what people do with the sort of limited horizons. You can't choose every option. In, the, in, the, in these Bayesian algorithms, the, the algorithm, you don't have to choose every one first. Of course, you make use of your priors. So, um, so here you have 100 options, 90 choices. Um, you pick... Uh, you get, you find out your rewards. You pick another. You find out your reward, and then you know you're told that you're going to get paid uh, according to you know how much reward that you accumulate. And we we played them. Uh, we we played had them play uh, two different reward surfaces that look kind of like this. In fact, in one direction it was just noise, and the other direction in the in the first re reward surface is just a single global peak. In the second one, there's a global peak on the right and a, a local uh, max on the left. It's slightly more complicated. Um, and, um, you know, kind of amazingly enough, when we took the data and fitted it to some, to some models of um, regret, so here is looking at um, actual regret accumulated over time, um, we actually found, I mean, you could call this, you know, cognitive phenotypes, three different kinds of behaviors. In fact, maybe the, the two at the, the sort of performing not so well, you could, we could even lump together, about 80% of the people did either sort of linear in time, which is, which, you know, is what you might expect, because they didn't know anything, right? You're just sort of searching around. Um, or this is sort of like power law to the 0.9, but but 20% did according to that green curve, which is logarithmic. So that's a fit to a, the solid line is a fit to a logarithmic in time. It's kind of interesting, right? So you can hypothesize lots of different ways in which people might have done so well. And one of the ways we hypothesized, I think because we're so motivated by this, this correlation structure, was that when some people looked at this game, it's possible that they imagined that there was some spatial correlation. I mean, I might have. Make, makes me think of that um, board game uh, Battleship. I don't know how many of you have played that. You know, where you really can think about correlation scales because you know the size of the boats, and you know you don't necessarily pick every single block, right? You sort of spread them around, and so it could be that some people looked at it and saw that and did much better, and that some people didn't know what to do and just kind of went up and down and picked the first ninety um, blocks. Um, so what we did was just to sort of this is a just sort of demonstration of our hypothesis was to sort of think about. Um, you know, using a small number of parameters for our, our model. So we're assuming that the prior on the mean is just everybody has puts the same. There's no reason not to get, to give a different prior to uh, different options. They have the same prior mu not for every every option. Um, but then we we included this um, sort of exponential in the distance uh, with the length scale of lambda. So lambda being a, a second parameter in the model. Uh, sigma naught is the variance, and this v is this temperature. And we just pick something constant. And so we we um, you know picked a, a, two uh, sequences of, of parameter values so that we could show you how we can recover with. You know, what sort of distinguishing about the blue is that they assume no, that there's completely rough surface, there's no correlation, um, and that, that, that decision maker does something that's linear, but we can recover this kind of logarithmic performance with somebody who doesn't really have good priors otherwise, except that they have, they have some notion of a reasonable length scale in terms of correlation. 
So that was kind of exciting. Um, you know, we thought about various ways in which one could use this, for instance, in this notion of human robot teams. So uh, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, so suppose we had our automated algorithm working and the automated algorithm for sending, say, robots around to find things realized it had sort of lost track of what the spatial scales were. So maybe they'd say, hey, can you take over to the human who would take over and make some choices and from their actions, the machine could then estimate something about that, say, that spatial correlation scale that maybe the person couldn't articulate, but, and then they could say, fine, I got it, and, and move on. So these ideas of, of how can we sort of estimate from, um, from behavior parameters that are meaningful is something that we looked into. So we actually have a paper with, uh, with my student Paul um, on uh, developing um, uh, estimators uh, for um, these kind of softmax decision-making models. And then we went ahead and actually applied it to the data to see if we could understand things about this data. And, and as you might expect, it didn't tell us very much about what the poor performers were doing, because there could be lots of different reasons why people were performing badly. But it did kind of tell us very well, we got sort of some statistical significance in what was going on with the high performance, so per high performers. So for instance, we learned that they didn't have a lot of certainty, right, which makes sense. They didn't have a lot of certainty. They didn't know anything about what the means were, but they did um, um, essentially take advantage of this um, correlation uh, length scale. And we also saw that they matched their strategies to the, to the landscape. So they did something different in those two different cases, which were sort of one was easy and one was more challenging. So um, this is sort of the first movie I want to show you where, you know, you know, I sort of love this idea that there's this parameter that really plays into um, a performance that's very very relevant for these kinds of search problems. So what you're looking at here is, again, sort of this discretized resource field. This is now at my tank at Princeton, where I have these underwater robots. So this is like 21 feet across and eight feet deep. These are my little robots, they're about this big. They're now painted pink um, to you know, contrast with the green. A little crazy looking, but... Um, but so we have something like 37 uh, discretized re regions, and this little guy moves around um, trying to basically accumulate maximal reward. So you could imagine this is concentration of oil or plankton or temperature, and it's trying to find the hot spots. Um, and um, we basically run this algorithm. So this is sped up, I don't know, maybe eight times, I think. So you're looking overhead now in the tank of the vehicle in three different runs. In the bottom, the length scale is something like 25, right? It doesn't have to do much exploration, just thinks it's a super smooth resource field. The one in the middle has a length scale of five, and the one at the top basically thinks it's a completely rough surface. And um, so we run this. This is this UCL algorithm. Um, and what you see is the guy at the bottom, you know, very quickly figures out that that deepest red square is where he wants to be. Um, this guy is not too far behind, and this guy has to do a lot of work. He really has to go and keep checking everything out because he has no idea that anybody is related to anybody else on the surface. Okay. So, pretty exciting to think about that. You know, I'm, I've been very much involved in thinking about how we um, make decisions together, how... how um, how we can, you know, take advantage of uh, multiplicity in decision makers uh, to solve problems such as these explore exploit problems. And so I want to tell you about this new work where we're trying to do what, what I just told you, where we have multiple agents who actually can share information through a communication network. Okay, so a lot of inspirational work. Um, the first paper looks at um, a case in which there's some kind of central fusion center that can access everything. Um, there are people who've looked at uh, uh, multiple agents decentralized, but they're not communicating. They're just reacting to what they find out there. Um, and then there's this really nice paper by Mason and Watts in PNES, appeared several years ago. Um, so this is purely experimental. They didn't develop a model, but it looks like a multi arm bandit problem, and they play around with different networks among human participants and trying to understand the role of uh, the network structure. So this is quite motivational. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we came to understand the role of the network structure through this framework and through these, these um, algorithms and models. So... So in this case, we have um, uh, 
M, capital M decision makers, let's call them K equal one to M, and they're communicating over a graph, so let's just keep it easy, um, let's say a static undirected graph with Laplacian capital L, and I'm gonna stick with this uh, Gaussian um, uh, rewards on our arms. And we can, you know, generalize all these notions of regret. So the regret for agent K is just the regret we defined earlier. We can talk about cumulative regret over all agents up to time T. And likewise, we can talk, we can, you know, look at the, um, the sum where we're looking at the expected uh, number of times suboptimal arms are chosen up to time T. And so here's the idea. So the way we, I'm going to show you the frequentist version for, first, um, uh, but we also have a, a Bayesian version of this as well. Um, so the way we, we're, we're going to use this, the network and pass information is, I mean, it's, just, you know, for, as a start, it's somewhat idealized, but we're going to allow individuals to pass their estimates of the options. And each one is going to have a running consensus algorithm to update its, app, its, its estimate of, of the of what it thinks the rewards are. In fact, it is, we're gonna, we set it up so that it has two uh, running consensus algorithms. One is to estimate the total reward that it thinks has been uh, um, received from arm I um, at up to time T per unit agent and the total number of times um, I was selected uh, per uh, unit agent up to time T. Um, so then it just divides one to the other and it gets its now uh, sort of consensus estimate of, um, of option I. Um, we can write down the row stochastic matrix from the Laplacian that keeps track of, of who's communicating with whom, and we can write down these running uh, consensus algorithms. So it's updating these estimates and updating its estimate of the arms. So I want to introduce, as I tell you these results, two important uh, measures. In fact, this epsilon CK is going to end up being this measure of what I told you at the beginning is an explore-exploit centrality index. Okay, it's kind of messy. This, the lambdas are the eigenvalues of our, our matrix capital P, and uh, BPI uh, is, so this is, it's a messy function, but it depends on the kth component of the eigenvectors of, of P. Um, so these just depend upon the graph. So epsilon sub n is sort of a measure of the, of the graph uh, structure, and epsilon ck is a measure of sort of individual uh, locations within the graph. So the, the first result on the, just this, this estimation step uh, uh, tells us that um, this estimate on the number of times a suboptimal arm has been chosen is upper um, and lower bounded by what a centralized uh, decision maker, centralized somebody getting information from everybody um, with error given by this epsilon sub n, right? So the sort of the graph structure determines how well this estimate comes out, which kind of is intuitive. And the, and, uh, the variance um, is upper bounded by something that bent, you know, sort of the kth guy depends upon essentially this measure of where it's located in the graph. Okay, so the algorithm, which is this um, uh, extension of uh, UCB, um, but now in this cooperative setting, and cooperative in the sense everybody's still trying to maximize their own reward, but they're sharing information. Um, now we, we do the same thing. You know, we have the agent um, pick the option um, that corresponds to its best guess, where the best guess is now the sum of its cooperative estimate through this running consensus plus this uncertainty measure which is built like the UCB but taking advantage of what we just learned of the, um, the variance that this guy is um, experiencing in its, its cooperative estimate. I didn't want to put epsilon CK in its algorithm because then it would have to know where it was in the graph but it, we, we've shown that if you replace it with this something that's sublogarithmic so we use like square root of log T um, we can then prove uh, performance. So this is kind of a messy expression, but we can show that the, you know, the expected number of times the agent K will choose, a, um, um, or if, actually this is the sum of all agents, will choose a suboptimal arm. Looks like this thing that's logarithmic in time, the first is independent of the graph. We have a term M epsilon N, which depends on the structure of the whole graph. And then we have these contributions in this upper bound per agent that depends upon its epsilon CK. So that's kind of this idea um, that 
you know, the bound on performance is a function of the graph structure, and we can think about, I mean, this is what I'm sort of proposing, that epsilon CK is a measure of explore-exploit centrality. So the higher, in this case, it's sort of like the inverse, the higher your epsilon CK, the, the bigger contribution you're making to this regret, okay? So it's sort of, you're sort of higher epsilon CK, the less central you are in terms of explore-exploit. Right. And so I'm going to just sort of illustrate that with this 10 arm bandit problem where I have four agents that are in a graph that looks like this, and I've put the, the values of the epsilon CK. So the guy in the center has zero, the, the two that are symmetric, 2.31, and the fourth guy is 5.43. Um, and you're looking at the regret curves. Um, the, the blue is the average of everybody, but you can see agent four, which has you know, the highest contribution to regrets, sure enough, is doing the, the least well, has the highest regret curve, the green curve. Um, and the red one, who's very central, is doing the best, right? What's interesting is that if you explore those choices of that f of t, you can think about designing, designing sort of the distribution of performance. So if you only want one agent to do really well, you can sort of spread them out. So somebody does a lot more exploring and somebody gains by exploiting, but if you want the average to do well, then you might design it differently. Um, so we also, uh, just sort of to further investigate the role of epsilon CK, we looked at, this is 100 random graphs, again, the same 10 um, uh, arm bandit problem. We have 10 agents, um, so for each one of these 100 graphs, I think we did something like 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations, and we computed the sort of a normalized epsilon CK across the graph, and we're plotting it, um, we're plotting the expected um, cumulative regret up to something like 500 time steps for all those different values of epsilon CK, and we can see it's quite correlated with performance, right? So it's another kind of evidence of the role of this proposed centrality index uh, on performance. So now I want to show you, so this was a movie you would have missed, but for our amazing technical people. Um, so this, this is, um, I just want to show you the sort of social setting. So now I'm going to take this algorithm and implement it on these two robots that are sitting here in this field. They don't know what the field, you're looking at the um, basically expected rewards given by this sort of 20 spotlights. So the red is, is the, the reddest one has got the highest reward value. Uh, these blue, the bright blue one is the lowest reward value. Um, and so this is, this is this cooperative UCB algorithm. And what I'm actually going to show you here, so we ran it with uh, this pair being uh, fully connected, uh, so like an undirected graph, so a complete graph. Um, we ran it with them being unconnected. And then what I'm going to show you here is the example where we ran it with a directed graph. So in this case, the, um, the green is receiving information uh, from the purple guy, and the purple guy is, is basically independent. He's just get passing information. Um, and so you're going to see the regret curves. Let me just get it started because this is UCB, so they have to check out each option first. So each one is basically playing each option. This is also sped up. These are just little Roombas. Um, but I think it's, I mean, I find it kind of helpful just to see it. <laughs> and there's a little um, obstacle avoidance algorithm. And they're allowed to be on the same place. And they don't have to, sh there's no conflict here. So they don't share reward. They both get the reward if they're there. So you can see the, the um, you know, they're checking out the, the second to best option. There's the best option. But remember, the, um, the purple one doesn't ha know anything from the, the green one. So he's doing a lot of a lot more exploring, the, re the, the green one is sort of sitting fat and happy as he's getting lots of, lots of information. It looks like he's kind of bossing the other guy around, but he's not, he's just, he's just getting you know, the opportunity to share what he knows. Every once in a while he checks out that. But you can see the regret curve, so the, the green one is doing, in the faded, uh, uh, fade, I don't know if you can see it, the faded, uh, it's doing as well as the two who would do that are talking to each other, and the other guy is doing just as badly as the, the other independent guys. So, you know, we've done this cooperative, as I said, in the case of Bayesian um, uh, decision makers. So here's some comparisons. So for instance, um, a single agent does, this, does, you know, doing UCB does what the, the red curve looks like, the red curve. Um, the algorithm we just saw is the, the blue curve. Um, we can improve on that. Um, uh, like the, the black curves, if, if everybody was talking to everybody in that 10, um, or the, the four agent case, the, the 
The cyan curve, the light blue one, is when we do the Bayesian version and they have some good priors, so they can do even better um, than an all-to-all -all case without priors. Okay, so I think, I, well, I don't remember when I started, but I'm gonna try to <laughs> speed it up. So um, I just wanna finish with a few more remarks because there's a lot of other things that one can say about there's a lot of other things that are going on when humans make decisions. I mentioned at the beginning this idea of switching costs. Um, uh, so we've adapted some, um, some work. So this is sort of an extrapolation. We haven't tried this with humans yet. I don't know what humans do exactly when there are switching costs, but you can take the algorithms that we have and adapt them. Uh, this is a, called a block algorithm where the idea is that you, it's costly to switch. So like over increasingly large blocks, you stay where you are. And if you design that in such a way so it's sub-logarithmic in time, you can still get the, the, the choice of where you switch to to dominate, and that will be logarithmic in time. Um, we're also interested in, because we're thinking about so sometimes you can't get from one option to another, right? So we're thinking about um, what we call multi-armed bandits on a graph. So, you know, in order to switch from one, you have to, you have to only switch to an option that's available, right? And so it, it's very similar to the previous case because you'd like not to, I mean, you always would take the shortest path, but you'd like to do as little of switching to, to, to hard to get to places. And so the, we have also extended uh, this block algorithm to this, this graph MAB problem. Another thing that I think is quite interesting, I get this, we, we got this question a lot from uh, people in biology, which was, you know, maybe people don't always try to optimize. Maybe there's, you know, what, what is some version of a satisficing. Maybe you only need to be above a certain threshold, and maybe you don't need to have a, like a hundred percent confidence in what you're doing. Um, so we looked at this. Um, we have a we have a paper that's up on archives uh, for for defining, you know, a satisfying objective in the context of multi arm bandits. This allows for less risk, you know, taking. You don't have to. You can be much more conservative. You know, the animals might use this because you know, it's scary to leave a patch you're at, not knowing you know if there's going to be good insects at the next patch over. Um, so here's the idea that we define satisfaction. This is one way you can define it in terms of mean rewards. So satisfaction would be you know, if I have some threshold that I care about, then you know, I'm satisfied if um, if if. You know the the expected reward is above that threshold, so I might choose the arm. And then the sufficing part would be that you know if you think about um, that that um, that variable s t, which is one if I'm above the threshold and zero otherwise, is is a realization of a binary random variable. Then the probability that that variable is one it doesn't have to be one; it can be something less than one. We call that delta sufficing, right? And so. You know, then the, the satisfying ob objective can kind of be written as a maximizing objective, but you're 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 maximizing um, either that you're above the threshold or that the probability um, that this random variable is one is is greater than one minus some delta. And so you can write down again the same idea. Write down this sort of best possible in this setting. Um, we call this the M delta satisfying algorithm. So that would be your QI. And again, you now you select an arm such that that uh, the QI is above a threshold. You don't need to pick the best one unless that's an empty set, right? And so we can prove performance in this case, and we also have a version where instead of doing satisficing in mean reward, you do it in um, instantaneous reward. We call that robust satisficing, and it's, it's an interesting story. In the case of the one that I just showed you, for example, you know, you can show, that this is a um, this is just a demonstration of looking at the actual reward as a function of time in the case where we just choose the, the standard um, uh, algorithm versus this, this delta status uh, sufficiency algorithm. So the performance is not quite as good, but it's pretty darn good. Um, and what we get in return is that the number of switches in this, you know, this sufficing um, case is much lower. We don't have to do as much switching, and we can do almost as well. Okay, I'm going to just end by telling you about a couple of places where we're kind of exploring, exploiting and exploring these ideas. Um, one is uh, I've been doing a lot of work in collaboration with people in the dance world. Uh, it's kind of a phenomenal place to think about collective decision making. And this was a recent project with a choreographer. This is actually a piece that 
um, was performed in New York. Um, it's a sort of an improvisational piece. It was performed last March, where literally it's an improvisation where the dancers have to make choices collectively through motion. They're communicating through motion among sort of this, this finite set of sort of pre-choreographed dance modules. Really fascinating, unbelievably fascinating, because you can actually talk to them. And we, we did sort of manipulations in the rehearsals that were experiment-like. It's incredible. Um, and uh, uh, we developed a model uh, to explore this, these dynamics. And it ended up being incredibly sort of generative for us, because we adapted and refined the model based on what we learned. And the, the composition changed. So some of the, some of the you know, modifications that we did in rehearsal became part of the performance, which was really exciting and rewarding. Uh, we also have a really um, neat project with National Geographic, where this sort of a big decision-making project we, we use there. Uh, they build these critter cams, which are cameras that they put on animals. Um, so that we can do this kind of you know, ad hoc network for, um, you know, they want to observe the wildlife, um, but the, the cameras use a lot of battery power, so the idea is how do we come up with algorithms to, to um, turn on and off cameras so that we can observe what's going on and learn. I mean, ultimately, we want to learn and refine models and then have those drive these, these algorithms. Um, um, but there's lots of, you know, really challenging decision-making, lots of uncertainty. We've been doing this in uh, Mozambique where there's, you know, I can't tell you how much uncertainty there is. Uh, just another example of the kinds of ways these kind of decision-making, um, uh, you know, th theoretical stories can fit into some, some exciting projects. So I will stop there. Um, I just want to... Uh, uh, Point out this is joint work with Paul Reverdy. Peter Langren is a, a student working on the social MAB stuff currently, graduate student, uh, Vipas Rivastava. I want to thank my wonderful group, my family, and uh, support. Thank you for listening. Quick questions. Maybe we can take a few quick questions. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe question two. In the explore scheme, you have to find the right scale for the colors in alpha. Uh, sorry, lambda. You think there's a way that you can search, maybe also learn what would be the optimal lambda? Yeah. You think about it, start with the very coarse and then successively. Yeah. So, it, in fact, you know, we talked about that a lot back when I was doing these ocean experiments. And, you know, the oceanographer, he referred to that as the co-array. So if you want to sort of collect data, you want your array of sensors to have kind of the optimal um, uh, resolution. Yes. If you want to learn what that spatial correlation scale is, you have to do absolutely the opposite thing. You have to, like you said, you have to try, mm -hmm. you know, you have to try every different um, uh, uh, separation, right? And so, you can't kind of, it's hard to do both at once. I mean, you can if, you know, use, um, you know, some dynamics on, on these arrays, but it's interesting that they're kind of the opposite problem. So if you want to do well at one, then, you, you know, it's a disadvantage to the other. Um, so we used his expertise, actually, because um, he had been in Monterey Bay a, a lot, right? But it's an interesting question, right? So, you know, how do you balance those two um, tasks, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, what I've learned is that people will find structure even where there isn't structure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we didn't. I mean, I only yeah. the only experiments we did. There, so John Cohen in his lab, they were doing some really. I don't, you know, I don't know if they ever wrote it up, but they did some beautiful experiments where they played around with people um, looking at. Um, these sort of grid worlds where they would adjust the length scale and to see the role of uh, the length scale in the algorithms that people would use. And in fact, they kind of um, built in the fact that they would be Bayesian uh, learners by uh, flashing up a few um, candidate you know, fields so they would get a sense for what that length scale was. So they didn't actually have to learn it. Um, and then they would just 
then the hidden field that they would work on would be would have that same length scale. So they would already know in advance, which was I thought was brilliant because then you don't have to worry about like am I is that a right thing to be modeling? Whereas we we have no idea what people were thinking, but. Um, and they were able to show some interesting things about, like they looked at experiments where the goal was either like a pure explore or a pure exploit or something in between, and then to see what people did. And then also to see the role of, you know, like when, when, it, when it became so coarse, people just did all kinds of things. I mean, so that's the place where I've seen, I've seen it. We didn't, we didn't end up um, doing that. Or I don't actually, I should get access to that data. That would be interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry? So, um, some of the young human subjects did good, some did not so good. So, I was wondering if you had any oh. data. Like we don't. I mean, that's the disadvantage to Mechanical Turk. I mean, we. We, we limited like the locations. Um, I think we tried to limit that they couldn't play the same, you know, multiple times from this, at least for the same, same computer. I mean, I think they get paid like a dollar fifty, so it'd be really weird if they'd want to get up and like use another computer in their house for the same game. It was something like the day after Christmas, so people were bored, I guess. And uh, but yeah, so that's one of the disadvantages. You lose a lot of quality control on your subject, and you don't. I, th I know people have done experiments with mechanical Turk, and they, there are surveys, and you ask questions and things like that. Or, um, and people will do things like throw out data where they can kind of detect that people aren't actually playing the game, you know, because somebody could just be sitting there. Because what this would do, uh, and I think Paul might have done that to some extent, what this would do was if you didn't, there was a sort of a time uh, limit, you couldn't sit there forever. And if, if it, you reached that limit, it would just take where you were as the, your next choice. But we could see that if somebody, if it was just the same point for the whole time, right? But that's all we had. It would be interesting to ask other kinds of questions or run other kinds of tests to see um, how we could, we didn't do any distinguishing by individuals, but that would be interesting, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So we actually, we, the data set was larger. We did some other things. Um, like we did some, we had different timings. We had um, did some other things that are kind of out of the scope of this particular experiment. So not, I, I don't even know if every, how many, what fraction did both. Many players only played one of the two, right? So this is like a, yeah. So we didn't have a lot of data on people who played both. Yeah, but that's a good question. So let's think now, I mean, if somebody should be So for interest of time, because I know that people, some people have to take, you know, fly or time. Uh